Hi, I'm Brian Hale, and I want to welcome you to another edition of A Better Life brought to you by New Horizons Community Church here in Skowhegan, Maine. Now, this is the second session of this four-week series, and our first one was on being Christ-centered. And we're talking about relationships, whether it's husbands and wives, dating relationships, or if you're single and you hope someday to be in a relationship. Today, we're going to talk about being mission-minded. And I know that sounds like a church thing where we talk about being mission-minded or being a missional church. We're going to talk about being mission-minded as a couple. It's going to be great, and hopefully it'll be something that will change your outlook on your current uh, or, and, or your permanent relationship with your spouse or one that you hope to have in the future. So grab your Bible, and I'll see you right after the service. God bless. great to have you here at New Horizons. I'm telling you right now and to our friends that are watching at home and online, Somerset County area, we love you guys. Question for the congregation. Anybody ready to hear from God's word today? Okay. Mm -hmm. Are you really ready? Okay, I can feel it. I feel it from our first row. That would be, be Sheila. Now we're in part two of our message series and it's called Relationship Goals and I hope that all of you in one form or another, have some meaningful goals. Um, you likely have some financial goals. I know I do. You might have some business goals. You might have some spiritual goals. You might have some fitness goals. I'm planning on setting some of those very soon for myself. Uh, I have a goal to set a goal to set the goal. But I hope that you have or are beginning to develop some relationship goals that we are seeking God to, ha to honor him with our relationships. So if you have some goals in your relationships, I hope they're incredibly meaningful goals. So in this message series, uh, we recognize that we don't want people to have what normal people have because normal is hurting, normal is afraid, normal is divorced, normal is broken, it's insecure. We want something different, don't we? Come on, do we want something different? Yes. To have something different, though, we must set some different goals. So we have four of them for our marriages that we're talking about. So if you missed last week, uh, let me review. The first goal that we want to have is we want to be Christ-centered. Okay? We want to be Christ-centered. So in all that we do, so that's, that's the, the big difference, though, we're, we're, it's different than just calling yourself a Christian. It's actually living a Christ-centered life. We also want you to be mission-minded. And we'll talk about this one today. We're going to be Christ-centered, mission-minded, and devil-kicking, standing strong together. And we're going to be covenant-keeping, covenant-keeping. So I would love all of you all across this church right now just to help me say this aloud. We're going to have some goals. So what are they? Number one, we're going to be... Christ-centered, okay, thank you, Christ-centered, we're going to be mission-driven, we're going to be devil-kicking, and finally we're going to be covenant-keeping, wow, that was like trying to wake some up from a long nap, no, I'm devil-kicking, covenant-keeping, can we say it like you mean it, because this is going to be a game-changer, say it like you mean it, what are our four goals, we're going to be Christ-centered, we're going to be mission-driven. We're going to be devil-kicking. And we're going to be covenant-keeping. Thank you. So I want to talk to you about, I want to talk to you about being mission-driven. But I want to warn you up front. This message is going to take some work 
from you. In fact, I'm going to end this service differently than I've ever ended a service before. If you were with us last week, I talked about being Christ-centered, and I gave you one small application, and that was to simply pray together every day a 30-second prayer, a 60-second prayer. I even wrote the prayer down for you, and I put it in your bulletin last week. It honestly can't get any easier than that one. In fact, I had someone tell me that they've been praying with their wife every day this same prayer. And you know what he said? That's a powerful prayer. If you didn't have it, uh, if you didn't pray that prayer, and if you'd like to pick that up again, see Mary, she'll print you out another bulletin, and, and that's if we still have it on the computer. Um, Mary, do we still have it on the computer? She says yes. So please, don't let this message series just go by as something that we do at church, we just listen. Don't do that. Now this one, though, is going to take a bit of work, and I need to warn you ahead of time, if you're ready to do a little work, I need you to, kind of like our, 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 my gym teacher in high school, he used to make us grunt and growl and get in this position, and, and we'd have to go, I'm ready! Ouch. Can you do me a favor and say, I'm ready? I'm ready. See, I, I knew Miles would take the, the ninth grade approach. Thank you, Miles. I appreciate that, buddy. See, many times in the past, when I would do premarital counseling, I had a technique, and I tried to push the couple in different ways to help them prepare. So here's my little secret behind the scenes. I would almost always look at the couple a few minutes, and, and I'd watch their time together, and they would walk in, and they'd always be the same. They'd be lovey-dovey-dovey, dovey, dovey, snuggle, 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 touching everywhere all over. The, they would be like that. You know, hearts and flowers would be flying in the air, and at some point I would say, you know what? I'm, uh, right now I have couples looking at each other going, did we ever have hearts and flowers in the air? But I would turn to them and I'd say, I'm, I'm a little confused. I'm not, I'm just, I'm not really convinced that you should get married. And I'd watch the blood drain from their face. And what I would do is I'd try to force them to defend, to give me a real reason why they should get married. And so I'd say, why do you want to get married? Anyway, I mean, why do you think, let's put it this way, why do you think you're supposed to get married? <laughs> and almost inevitably, they'd go silent. And then one of them, whoever, you know, the, the, the spokesperson, there's always one in the couple, and if you don't know who that one is, it's probably you. The spokesperson would always speak up, and I'd say, so why do you think you're supposed to get married anyway? Because I'm, I'm not sure you are. And they'd go, and it's, and it's long, and it's one thing after another. And then they'd, they'd say something like, ready? Because we'll be happy. Because we're in love. <laughs> because of all the songs on the radio, the love songs, they now make sense. Because we'll be happy. Everyone say, we'll be happy. Oh, and what I would try to do is I would try to help them to see is that the foundation in your notes of godly marriage, it isn't happiness. It's unity. It's unity. Happiness may be a byproduct of a, a unified marriage. A unified marriage. That's what God wants. Not necessarily a happy marriage, but a happy marriage could be a byproduct of a unified marriage. Happiness, however, and I think you married people know this, can come and go, right? But we must be unified around something bigger than ourselves. We have to be. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. We're going to talk about being unified in mission, being mission driven now i know that churches nowadays we all talk about being missional churches being a mission driven church and that's great and there's nothing wrong with that but i'm talking to you about being mission minded mission driven in your relationship genesis chapter 1 27 says this god created mankind in his own image in the image of god he created them male and female he created them god blessed them and he said to them Go do your own thing. Follow your heart. Do whatever makes you happy. No, that's not what he said. God blessed them, and he said, 
he said to them, and the man and the woman, he said, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and, and subdue it. In other words, the very first thing that God said to this couple was, here's your mission, you, should you choose to accept it, is you go and you create, you multiply, you subdue, conquer the earth. Now here's what's really interesting to me, is that the very first thing that God says to the very first couple is, you have a mission. And the very last thing that Jesus said before he ascended into heaven is, here is your mission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to do everything that my Father commanded them to do. You people have a mission. Why should you get married? Why? This is the one that's going to be a game changer for a lot of you married folks and for some of you that hope to. Because we can serve God better together than we can apart. Somebody say amen. amen. There, there's huge stuff in this. and I could literally do 10 more sermons on this alone. The very first thing that God says is, here's your mission, go out and multiply, subdue the earth, conquer it. So verse 24 of Genesis 2 says, and this explains why a man will leave his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are what? Say it aloud. Say it. The two are united. They are? Uh, they are what? They are one. What does God want to do? God wants to unite. God wants to unite. I'm going to say it again. God wants to unite. The problem is, is what God seeks to unite, the devil schemes to divide. Because whatever matters to God, our spiritual enemy hates. So you can look at the story of Adam and Eve. God creates them. He gives them a mission. They're happy. They're blessed. They're content. They're fulfilled. They're in love. After all, they're naked in paradise. How much better is that? You can't get better than that. Then the enemy comes up in the form of a serpent. And the enemy is the force of darkness. He wants to disrupt their relationship with God. He wants to distract them from their mission. He wants to destroy their unity. So what does the serpent do? What God wants to unite, the devil wants to divide. So the first thing the serpent does is he separates Eve from Adam. Psst, 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 psst. Eve, Eve, psst. come over here. Come away from the spouse for a minute. Come here. Psst. I think that's what he would, I don't know, I'm just, that's my serpent, that's the best it gets. Then the serpent says to Eve, he goes, and I, I, I could preach 10 sermons right on this next line. Did God really say you're not supposed to eat from the fruit of that one tree? So the first thing that the serpent does is he questions the word of God. Not just the word, but the authority of God, which really are the same thing. Then the serpent presents her with some pleasing fruit in some form. And he says, doesn't this look delicious? You want this. Because what you won't have, what, what, what is, is what you need to be happy, is this. You'll be fulfilled. You'll be, you'll be satisfied. And so she takes a bite of it, and her eyes are open. And she runs over to her husband. She has to because she wasn't there, because the, they were separate. And now she has to go to where he is. And she, it's amazing. She goes, this is just awesome. This is better than a Big Mac. Try it. you got to try this with me. And it's so incredible. He eats it, and suddenly, you know what happens? Sin enters the world. And they realize that they were naked, and we feel so ashamed. And God comes onto the scene. And he says, what in the world has happened? And suddenly, what was united is now divided. Because what does Adam do? 
The first thing that Adam does, this is his wife who he's loved, who's supposed to love forever there in paradise. The first thing he does is he blames, he blames both God and Eve. Watch what he says. He, God says, what has happened? Adam says, well, this, this woman, this woman you put here with me, she gave me the fruit to eat. And then Eve, well, Eve blames the serpent. And the serpent doesn't have a leg to stand on. Hashtag dad joke. Hashtag bad preacher joke. Hashtag I've been wanting to do that for years. And I'll probably never do it again, okay? But I might because you guys are very gracious to me. And so I might just do that. Okay. The two will become one flesh. What God has united, the devil schemed to divide. Unity and mission. Amos chapter 3, verse 3. Amos asks a great question. He asks the question, can two people walk together without agreeing on one direction? Do we have agreement? Are we moving in the same direction? Imagine if I'm with my wife, with Karen, all right, and we're going to go for a walk. And can we get to the same destination if I say, you know, I'm going to go this way, and she says, well, I'm going to go this way. We cannot get there. In fact, the enemy, if the enemy was to divide, well, what is division? Let's talk about that for a second. Division. Division. It means two. Division. Or, or two visions. Or is direction. Two visions or directions. Two different directions. Two visions. How can we, how can we get somewhere with two visions? How can we please God with two visions? In fact, Proverbs says this, where there is no vision, the people perish. And I'm telling you right now, a divided vision in a husband, that is perishing. So, Because we could loosely apply that to marriages. Where there is no unity in mission in marriage, we often find ourselves struggling. I can't tell you how many struggling marriages I know where they'll say, well, I go do my thing. I'm going to do my thing. You do your thing. What God wants to unite, the enemy wants to divide. So, so why, why are you going to get married? What's your marriage about? Hmm? What is it? One of the greatest tragedies in marriage is that when two people are together, but they're not united. When two people are together, but they're not united. If you ever ask me, what's your favorite couple in the Bible, Pastor? I, they, it's, it's an amazingly cool couple, and, they, and p- most people have never heard of them. My favorite couple in the Bible, it's not Adam and Eve, and it's not Ruth and Boaz, although I think they're pretty cool. It's not Rachel and Jacob, although I think they're pretty cool too. It's not Mary and Joseph. It's not Solomon and his 700 wives and 300 concubines. I mean, you got, you got to admit, I mean, that's got to be like the most complicated thing. Could you imagine 700 weddings? Hmm? Seven, 700 women getting mad at you, all wanting to jump out of the vehicle while you're driving because they're mad at you? How insane that would be? 700 mother-in-laws? I do that just to set up the men that would laugh, and then you wives can talk about that later. Because I have the best mother-in-law in the whole world. My favorite couple in the Bible is maybe a couple you haven't even heard of. They're only mentioned six times in the Bible. But what I love about this couple is that every time one spouse is mentioned, the other spouse is always mentioned. You'll never hear about the wife without hearing about the husband, and you'll never hear about the husband without the wife. You always hear them mentioned together. So if you ask me what made them strong, I'm going to answer you without a shadow of a doubt what made them strong was that this couple was Christ-centered. They were incredibly mission-driven. I'll show you this. Their names are Priscilla and Aquila. Romans chapter 16, verses 3 through 5. And it gives us some insight about this married couple. The word says, Give my greetings, Paul says, to Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in the ministry of Jesus Christ. Now watch this, watch this. In fact, not one of them, but both of them, one time risked their lives for me. Paul says, I'm thankful to them. 
and so are the Gentile churches. I also give my greetings to the church that meets in their home. Wow, this is great. I'd love to have this couple in church. So what do we know about this couple? We know that together they supported Paul's ministry. We know that they both risked their lives for Paul at one point. We know that they led a life group. Did you see that? Greet the church that meets in your home. I got news for you. When you lead a life group, it's a church. Because you're gathered together for the teaching of the apostles. You share things in common. You, you talk about the word and you worship. To me, that's church. They led a life group. And what we know about them is that they were incredibly powerful because they were united in mission, Priscilla and Aquila. God wants to unite you together to do something significant for his glory. I know you've got this dream and this dream and I've got retirement and I've got job and I've got vacation and I've got kids. And I'll, you know what? If that's not centered around the mission of Christ, this, 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 and this, and this, it doesn't matter. And I'm not talking as a pastor. I'm talking as a follower. It doesn't matter. Because this, this, and this, and this is what we call operating in the flesh. If it's not centered around Christ, in other words, yes, maybe I would like to retire someday. Why? So I could devote more of my off time now that will be incredibly larger to serving Christ. Maybe I have this dream job. And maybe this dream job would be great. It might bring in more income. It might be fun to do. But while I'm doing it, I'm going to do it in such a way that I am a powerful witness for Christ. Then it's, then it's worth it. Now, I know, and I have to address this every time, what about for those of you that are not married? You may go, oh my gosh, I hate this sermon. Now, how does this apply to me? What am I supposed to do with this? Well, if, if you were here with us last week, I talked about the idea that if you ever desire to have a Christ-centered marriage, if you desire a Christ-centered marriage, say, in the future, you're going to want to live a Christ-centered life today. And actually, someone said amen then. Can I get one today? Thank you. So let me apply this week's message this way. If you want a God-honoring, mission-driven marriage in the future, then you live a God-honoring, mission-driven life today. Because here's the thing, is when you're single, it's so easy for it to be all about you. No, 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 no. If you're living now all about him, look, not to you, not waiting on some spouse to complete you. Remember, Jesus is the one who completes you. You can serve him fully and faithfully today. Your greatest goal, my friends, is not to get married. Your greatest goal is to honor God. And then a senior said, thank you, seniors. If he chooses someone to come alongside you, to come beside you, you worship him for that, but you don't need that to honor him today. Am I making sense? Okay. Don't wait until the future. You live a mission-driven life today. Now, I heard about this one girl. This one girl, she was an amazing girl. She was raised in the church, had godly parents, you know, and she did all of the, the children's camps, the teen camps, and was just this amazing Christian person. And then she went off to school, and she joined a sorority like a lot of girls do, and, you know, they do those, you know, she, she got into the sorority, and they do those little sorority chants or whatever it is, you know. And I don't know how it goes. But anyway, they invited her to a party during rush week, all right? And so she went to the party, and, and they were there, and everybody's drinking from the keg. And she never did that before, but she thought, well, you know, everybody else gets to do it. I, I guess I'm going to do that. So she drank uh, just a little bit. Psst, psst, psst. Psst, psst, psst. She drank just a little bit. Psst, psst, psst. And then she drank too much. And then she did it again and again and again. And before long, someone offered her something a little harder, you know, some drugs and and then being drunk, she compromised, and she took some drugs, and she ended up going way too far with this one guy, and since she went too far with this one guy, well, she went too far with many guys, and then she fell headlong into this hard party scene. Great Christian girl gets tripped up. I've seen it dozens of times. A couple of years into this scene, 
you know, she's in the middle of this very dark world, and she sees a guy that everything she wanted the whole time she was growing up, he's cute, he's godly, he's bold, he's a leader in his fraternity, and, and, and she goes home and she says, Mom, I saw the most amazing man, the most amazing guy. He's everything I've ever dreamed about. I prayed about this guy the whole time I was growing up. And she described the guy to the mom. And the mom looked back at her and said, sweetheart, not in a condemning, but in a very a loving way, she said, baby, you need to acknowledge a, a guy like that is not looking for a girl that's living the way you're living right now. See, you don't, let me put it, but you can't. You can't wait until the future to get your life on track with Jesus. Hmm? If you want a God-honoring, mission-driven relationship in the future, your only plan is to live a God-honoring, mission-driven life today. Are you with me? Everybody still with me? Because I said it last week, and I want to say it again, I'll probably say it next week. You don't build a life of righteousness in the future on a foundation of sin today. Well, I'm not really sinning. Don't you love it? Really sinning? I'm not really sinning. Now look, I'm not a things preacher. I mean, I know that drugs and alcohol are bad. I know that smoking will kill you. All right. I know that porn will poison your mind, your heart, and divide your relationships. I know that if, if you're a regular attender in church or, or whatever and, and you think that everything you earn is for you and, and the Bible says that you're actually robbing from God by not paying tithes and offerings, can I tell you, you can't wait until a certain time to say, okay, maybe when I go to a different church, I'll start giving. Maybe when we get a new pastor, I'll start giving. Or maybe when this happens, I'll start giving. Do you know when the time to start giving is? is when God asks you. And if you're not hearing God ask you, maybe you need to check your heart. I'm not picking on anybody because I, for a long time, didn't. I had a great story today. Someone walked up to me and said, you know what, Pastor, you know we talked about tithing. I'm tithing this week. I said, you're not going to miss it. You're not going to miss it. And I'm not trying to... Look, I don't know if he made $5 and he's trying to give just, you know, 10% of $5. I don't care about the money. I never have. I care about the people that claim, yes, Lord, everything is yours. Everything is yours, except. It doesn't work that way. It never has. So what do you do if you're not married? And you hope one day to have a great relationship. Well, I like what Pastor Andy Stanley says. He's one of my favorites. He says, become the person that you're looking for is looking for. Become that type of person you'll want to wear, marry that one day, the one that you're looking for. So today, you live a God-honoring life. So what do you do? With everything in you, you say, Pastor, I'm just walking towards Jesus. I'm just pursuing Jesus. Jesus is my focus. He is my will. And I want to show his love to the world. I want to make a difference in this world. Because really, seriously, when we talk about things like this, making the difference in the world for Jesus is the only difference that matters. It really does. And as you're walking toward Jesus, now this is where it happens. If you're walking towards Jesus, Jesus is right there. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Every now and then, I, yeah, I want you to keep your eyes focused on Jesus. You know, the author, director, perfecter of your faith. But every now and then, just, just glance. Okay? <clears throat> just for a moment, but not long. Just, just glance, just for a second. Just for a second. And if you see if there's anybody relatively attractive walking in the same direction towards Jesus like you. Do you understand? That attractive person needs to be on your peripheral, not your focus. Because if I'm looking here, who am I missing? Oh, boy, that's bad. But if I'm looking here, and all of a sudden, ah, I see someone that appears to have the, the, the same passion, 
the same pace because I'm not going to be able to bring someone along. I can't fix someone. I, I can't do that. And if you see her or if you see him, you, it's just kind of like you're walking together and you develop this friendship around Jesus. And you're walking toward Jesus with everything. You develop a spiritual relationship. Remember, because this person's always going to be your number two, right? This, Jesus is number one. And then one day, you recognize, I think we can actually serve Jesus better together than we can apart. And you quote scripture to that person. And I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you what I think is the perfect line, the perfect line. When you finally are ready to join hands in following the Lord with another child of God, you could say the following. Are you ready? Hey, come glorify the Lord with me. Hmm? Let's exalt his name together. You invite them. Why are you getting married? Because I'm not sure you should get married. There's no um. Um. Why are you getting married? Because we can serve Jesus better together than we can apart. So what's, what's your goal? My goal is to be Christ-centered. Somebody help me to be mission-driven and to be devil-kicking and to be covenant-keeping. That is why we're coming together. So what is your mission? What do you stand for? If, if you are married, let me ask you this, married people, what is your mission? Oh, where do you serve? Where, as a couple, do you glorify God? You might say, I don't even know what you're talking about, Pastor. Going in the same direction? Well, we might drive a golf cart together to church or something, maybe. I don't know. Is that what you mean? Probably. But a much broader scope than that, let's say. It may be particularly what you do to glorify God in church. In church, but hopefully also you glorify God outside the church. Because the church was never meant to be contained inside of a building. But we are the body of Christ released into the world to make a difference seven days a week, all for the glory of God. So what is your mission? Together as a couple. Boy, I hope, I hope to just stir some, some conversation. What unites you? Now think about this. What are the most unifying forces on the planet? If there's anything that unifies, what unifies? There's two things. There's a common mission that unifies and a, and a common enemy. Let me talk to you about this. If we're trying to do something together, that unites us. If we hate the same things, that also unites us. You know how it is at work. You can hate this one girl all day long, and then you get a boss that everybody hates, you know, and then you hate the boss together, right? And you like that girl that you didn't like before, but because you hate the boss together, okay. Maybe none of that is a real, not real to you, okay? I, I, I know I've read about it before. I've experienced it before. There's a common enemy and a common mission that can unite. So I'll ask you if you're married. What if you both righteously love the mission? Hmm? And what do you both righteously hate? Ooh. That thing just, you know, you take a look at it in, in, in the world and you say, God wouldn't like this. On behalf of him, I don't either. I don't either. And where you see those things unites. And that's often an indication to a great place. Perhaps God has joined you together to make a difference in this world. Maybe, maybe you both love hospitality and cooking. And so you see it in a real, very real ministry to show the love of Jesus by making meals or something like that. And listen, I've been on the receiving side of that. It's a great thing. How about when someone has a baby? When someone has a baby or someone loses uh, somebody, you make meals. Maybe you hate 
whenever people are coming to church and they feel all alone. Maybe you take in the 10 a.m. morning service and we're going to aggressively, passively show the love of Jesus to the people as they come in. What a wonderful thing. Maybe you see them coming in the door and you see that they're by themselves because you know what they look like when they come in by themselves. They walk into the big church and they're like, this is an indication that I need something. They need you. You don't beat them up. But you're like, hi, my name is I'm glad you're here. Let's go grab a coffee at the coffee bar. And you do that three weeks in a row. Fourth week, you invite them to dinner. This is not, as my friend would say, rocket surgery. It's not. It's so simple, isn't it? Isn't it? All it takes is for us to move. Maybe you used to be in a ton of debt. So you took a class and now you're out of debt. And you love financial freedom. And you hate the bondage of living paycheck to paycheck. So you lead a class together to help people find their way out of debt. That's possible. But you'll never find out how they're doing in debt until you go, hey, let me get you a coffee at the coffee bar. Three weeks and the fourth week you take them out and you befriend them in the name of Jesus Christ. Maybe both of you love kids, love kids, love kids. And you hate that there are kids in the community that don't live in a great home. And I'm going to tell you right now, I see it all the time. And so you recognize what we love and what we hate, and it leads us. Maybe God is calling you to foster a child. Hmm? What are you called to do together what is your mission your mission is not to grow old together that doesn't take effort you're not let me put it this way and i love my folks here you're not together just to be happy you're together to make a difference here's your mission should you choose to accept it what's your mission what do you do? Now, when I talk about this, I told you early on, this is going to take some work. Do not ignore this message. Do not stare out the window and, not, and just can't wait to get out of here. This is God talking to you. Because my prayer is, God, speak through me. Because I don't know. I don't know. I mean, we're, we're just trying to pay the bills and not kill each other right now. Do you know why you're trying not to kill each other? Because you're not unified. Amen? Amen? Fair enough. This doesn't mean you have to go and like start a 501c3 nonprofit and do something really big together. Here's what I hope you'll understand. Unity in marriage, it doesn't mean that you're the same. Unity means that you are together. You are together in this. You are together in this. So if there's one thing that really helped my marriage with Karen from the very beginning is we've been mission-driven. See, shortly after we were married, she married a guy that was in Tool and Die. But shortly after, I, I started working in children's ministries for free. You know, I was a volunteer. I wasn't even a member of the church. But I was given this wonderful opportunity and never think that a chance to serve is a drag or, or hard or something like that. It is just what I said. It's a wonderful opportunity because how many times have I told you there's no better place to be than in the center of his will. And if I'm serving him with my heart, that's his will. So I've been given the opportunity to serve from the very beginning and right from the very beginning, Karen was there serving right alongside me. So here we were. We were just married just over a year with a brand new baby and our first house. We only lived there for a year. And most of you know, and newlyweds didn't have three nickels to rub together. We got our first house. And you know that for the most part, you have to, you have to make payments for a minimum of five years before you sell the house or you lose anything you put in it because for the first five years, you're basically paying on interest. So here we are, we have this brand new baby, brand new house, and guess what happens? I get a call in the ministry, and we sell the house that we've had for one year. 
we pack up the kids and we move into full-time ministry as a children's pastor, and there was Karen. Karen was right alongside me. And now we're in a church of about 500 people. And, we, and then, after that, we were called to leave our home state, Michigan, her parents, my parents, right there. We moved to New York. Karen, now, in addition to serving me in children's ministry, had now taken up the role of leadership in ministry for mothers of preschoolers. Growing up, our children saw firsthand what serving the Lord in his church looked and felt like. So Karen and I have always served with the same purpose. Let's get people to know our Jesus. Because we're together. So when she comes to me with a new vision, I support her with counsel. And then I'm behind her as she leads something that matters to her. If it, if it, it doesn't mean that we have to be doing the same thing, but it means that we are in this together. I support God's call. You support God's call. For Carol's Sunday school class, don't settle for something that's less than that. Don't settle for something that's less than that. Don't just share an address together. Don't just have a sex life with somebody. Don't just evolve into roommates because your life was only about the kids. Don't just be about, oh, we like this sports team. Ah. Don't just be about your house or your amazing yard or your incredible Instagram showing off my shoes and my purse. And, ooh. Why are you getting married? Why are you going to get married? But do you know what? I've asked that question a half dozen times this morning. Why are you going to get married? Maybe now on the way home, you turn to that husband, you turn to that wife, and seriously turn to each other right now, you know, when you get in the car and say, honey, what can we do with our marriage? What can we say six months from now? Why are we married? Oh, wouldn't that be wonderful if you had real solid answers? Huh? Because you can serve Jesus better together. What are we? Help me out. We are Christ-centered. Say it. We are. We are mission-driven. Okay. What are we? We are devil-kicking. What are we? We are covenant-keeping. You know, a pastor did a wedding ceremony, and at the end of the ceremony, the minister had typed a typo in his notes. And when he said that the two would be uh, united, unfortunately, he typed the word mis by mistake, and it was a bad mistake because he typed the word untied. Just a typo. Untied. So later on, he looked at the typo, and then he realized there was only one letter that was out of place. Only one letter. When the letter I oh, was in the right place, you read united. But when I am not in the proper place, you become untied. Anytime, hey, listen, anytime I am not under the lordship of Christ, you know, I'm supposed to be unified in my marriage, we become untied. Where God wants to unite, the devil wants to divide. So one of the greatest things that you can do is have that, that something that is a driving force. In other words, we both love this. We both hate that. Therefore, God is using us to make a difference in this world. It doesn't have to be something big. It just needs to be something together. I told you this was going to be a difficult message. And at the end of most of my messages, I try to end with passion and inspire you to do something or emotional or convict, you know, to move you. But this time it's going to be a little more difficult because I'm not closing this message. The end of this message is 100% up to you. See you next week. Bye. All right, well, that concludes our service, and I did it rather abruptly. I did that because I didn't want the service to necessarily, or the message that is, to end. I want you to think about what you've heard, because there's work to be done now that you've been given the tools on what to do. That's what we do here. We tell people, and we help people in their walk, their walk with God, and in their walk with each other. So, 
If you're ever in the Skowhegan area, we'd love for you to walk with us on a Sunday morning. We're located right here at 31 East Madison Road in Skowhegan. Our telephone number is 474-2957, and our website is nhccskowhegan.org. Until next time, God bless you, and we'll see you for a better life. Bye-bye. Impossible, life has brought me to my knees, God of heaven.